Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. Feel free, get comfy, get seats. I hope you are got good use of all the snacks that they have out the front. I haven't had any yet because I think you're not supposed to eat lots of things before you talk, so I'm trying to be good, but afterwards I'm straight in there. So immediately after this, front of the queue. Um, and before I get into my talk, I wanted to get an idea just about who you all are. So if you could raise your hand or otherwise indicate if you're working in the tech industry. Okay, that was it. it's, it's, it's still morning, okay? And I know I heard the party was wild, so I wanted to keep the questions fairly easy. Um, <laughs> And who's working on something that they would consider a possible solution for the current climate crisis? Okay, awesome, yes. Some people in the room. Uh, a few less though. Who's working at a company that has some sort of public climate pledge, i.e. some sort of documentation of what they're, as a company, planning to do uh, towards the climate crisis? Okay, a few more, a few more maybe. Um, okay, let's check this clicker works. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you kind of get the point uh, that I'm kind of getting at is that we just can't wait for some speculative climate tech to save us. We need to be working on these solutions ourselves and we're in a good position. We need to make some hard decisions, but we also have a lot of the tools at hand already that we would need to do this. And it's, you know, so we can secure a livable future for not just our great, great, great grandchildren or, you know, beyond that, actually for like our children and even just for ourselves. So the stakes are really high. Um, and this quote on the left hand side, yeah, this screen is so big. I hope you can see the slides if I'm stood in the middle of it. Uh, but you can see from the IPC report that uh, was published last year, it kind of called out tech as one of the areas uh, where we, we need to kind of do more um, and be thinking about what potential tech can have to help us. So if you're a movie buff, because you're sat in a cinema. Uh, maybe you watched Don't Look Up uh, and kind of got some, like a rather more comedic uh, approach of what I'm talking about. So let me introduce myself. I'm Jessica Green. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a sleepy pioneer on Mastodon and most of those other platforms like the one that was called Twitter, um, but I'm not on that much anymore, I have to say. I'm a software engineer at Ecosure, and I'm also a community lady at Community Leader with Pi Ladies. In fact, I was persuaded to send a proposal into this conference uh, by Doreen, who's up here in front. So, thank you. Uh, this is also all your fault. So, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about myself and why I'm here and getting into the sector and talking about these things. So I'm a career changer. I used to work in film production. That's what I studied. And then I moved into speciality coffee and I worked as a coffee roaster. And this was really a good opportunity to kind of see firsthand a lot of the effects of climate change because at that time it was also affecting a lot of the places, oh, and it still is, affecting a lot of the places where coffee, coffee grows, which is predominantly along the equator belt. So when I switched into tech in about 2017, 2018, it was immediately clear to me that as well as switching into a different sector, I really wanted to work in a domain where my work would have an impact and contribute something uh, towards the current climate crisis. So I'm going to talk today about some of the, or what, what I see as the responsibilities of tech companies and professionals in the climate crisis. 
I'm going to share some of the ways I've heard or seen technology uh, being used for climate action. And I will say and emphasize, this is just some of the ways. So, you know, we need a diverse approach and a variety of approaches. Um, and I certainly couldn't cover them all. So I'm just going to highlight some that I found particularly interesting. I'm also going to talk uh, a little bit about my work at Ecosia, hopefully not as too much of a sales pitch, but just because I, I really feel like we have some good examples of how we're trying to achieve this. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth around the data uh, behind these technologies. Um, because if we've learned nothing from ChatGPT, is that it's all about the data. Uh, so <laughs> last and not least, because um, I want this movie experience that you're all having to have a cathartic ending, um, I'm going to highlight some of the ways that we can all work towards a better planet. So hopefully you will go away not feeling too pessimistic and be able to go into the, the coffee break and enjoy the rest of the conference. So let's get back to the issue at hand, the climate crisis. And here's the thing, we're largely in this crisis because we keep burning fossil fuels instead of finding a path off them. And we know that we have some ways that we could achieve this, but we're not doing it. We're essentially making a choice not to do it or not to do it at a speed that will get us to the goals we've set ourselves. And I think one of the things that we don't have a good grasp on is understanding responsibility. So it's, it's maybe easy enough for us to say, oh, well, our servers run on renewable energy. Um, or if you're relying on, you know, that's if you're running them yourselves, but maybe you're relying on a cloud provider and you say, okay, well, what are they running on? I can choose a renewable zone. You might also be able to provide your employees with train passes so they can avoid tra uh, car travel. Uh, or ensure that your office supplies are from sustainable sources, but how do you really measure and understand the impact that you're having? So we can break these types of emissions into different scopes. So the first scope is going to be our direct emissions from burning fossil fuels uh, to make our products. The second scope is going to be emissions from electricity. So that's the things I mentioned, like running uh, your products or running the office building. Uh, and then we're going to have emissions from our activity in our supply chain. So as I mentioned, maybe you're using third party suppliers for parts of your product um, and you kind of need to understand also what's going on with them and how much of that you have responsibility for. Because luckily we still have choices out there on these things. Um, and today, there are some ways that you can actually measure these in terms of uh, if you use AWS, for example, they have some tooling that will show you your carbon emissions for where the code's running, but they're not always complete. So we also have to be slightly critical and slightly aware of what's being covered and what's not being covered. Um, and, you know, these are things that right now it's not always easy to get the answer for. Um, but I think it's really important that we think about them. So if we want to go even further, how responsible are we for our users' carbon? So if we're creating products that encourage people to buy lots of new things, that's carbon emissions. So are we responsible for that, even though they chose to buy this? But we're providing the platform. So again, it's, it's complex, it's nuanced, um, but I think this is something that we can all think about. So the thing is, unfortunately, that most current business models, um, because of capitalism, as we heard about in the last talk, uh, either don't recognize that carbon responsibility uh, for the user's emissions is, is something that we uh, should be thinking about as a business, um, and they're kind of not really incentivized either to do so. So this is quite complex, as I mentioned, and I, I really want to stress before I go further, these are my thoughts on the topic, and I'm trying to get my head around it. And I'm sure there's some of you in the room, I know there's some of you in the room, who have ideas around this, and I really want to hear them too. 
So please think of this more as like a discussion starter rather than a here's all the answers. It's certainly absolutely not that. So let's think, what are the problems that tech can help us approach? And also hopefully uh, find some solutions for us. So I think there was a talk on this morning already about carbon markets by Tobias and the potential of AI, um, of AI to address some of those problems. Um, but where else can we, as everyone almost in the room, I believe said they were working in tech, where can we apply our collective skills uh, to tackle this crisis that we're in. So living in Germany in the last couple of years, you probably also have noticed that weather is not always our friend. Um, we are starting to see more and more extreme weather events. So weather forecasting is becoming a really important way that we can benefit humans on this planet but also understand better our impact. So there's a really awesome book called Angry Weather, and I'm not going to try butcher the German name, but it's by someone who's in German. Um, and this talks about climate attribution. So we can look at like weather events and tie them, their possibility of, of how intense they were and them happening to climate change. The other thing that we can look at is conservation, because at the moment we have various papers telling us that we're in this uh, mass extinction event. Many of you might be familiar with Extinction Rebellion. And this is one of the huge environmental threats uh, to the persistence of our civilization, because it's really irreversible and biodiversity is one of the things that really keep everything together. So. When I was working in coffee, we'd often learn about like coffee producers and how they go about that. And having a monocrop is always a really bad idea because then something comes along, destroys the entire crop, and you have no yield, no product, no money for the entire harvest. So a lot of the time, coffee also needs uh, shade trees to grow. So a lot of the time, it's all about having diversity in terms of the plants, but that's not where it stops. It's also, of course, diversity in terms of like animals and various types of uh, bacteria in the soil. So luckily for us, technology can do a really good job of helping us to build platforms where we're able to crowdsource the kind of work that needs to happen for identifying, uh, mixed with computer vision technology, identifying individual animals, understanding their habitats um, and the challenges that they're facing. So the Wild Me project uh, is really interesting. They have, I really like sharks and they have a shark book uh, where you can go in and look at different sharks and they label all of the individuals, uh, but they do have their animals too. So sharks aren't your thing, you got options. Um, and these kind of platforms are something that, you know, modern technology is allowing us to utilize and get everybody on board. Um, maybe you're not even that worried about, you know, the bigger convers uh, conver conservation issue. You're worried about your own animals. So I really loved this project where someone was looking at air pollution, which at the end of the day affects humans, but it can also maybe lead decisions in terms of like where you want to move your pet because that's, that's important. Energy systems is another area where I think we can apply data science techniques to make them more efficient. Uh, I know yesterday Barbara from uh, 1,5 degrees uh, was speaking and talking about um, the work that she's doing. I think techniques for forecasting load also allow us to find out not only when electricity is cheapest, but also when we can push renewables into the system for when it's needed most. And there's a lot of links on the slide, um, but I will share the slides and then you will have all of those. Uh, and sorry, I just realized the slide had not updated the, the quote there. So um, the quote on the last slide, which is also the quote on this slide, uh, is around buildings and making those also efficient. So it's not just about like our uh, energy supplies, but also being able to have efficient 
buildings that um, also are able to run more efficiently. And, you know, this is not just like a nice to have, it's also going to be something that we need to look at because the German government and the EU government are bringing regulations around energy for houses. So in Germany, there's some rules set for 2050, but there's like significant goals before then as well, which we all need to meet. And it's also around how we eat and how we produce food. So farming, um, this is from the farm of the future, this quote. And it's saying it's all about data, artificial intelligence and learning. The article that's taken from also shows they have this really cute little robot that's able to, again, leverage like computer vision to kind of understand how our crops are growing. Um, and we also need to really think about supply chains. So these are other things where we can apply technological approaches to be able to better optimize, make it more efficient and understand most, first and foremost, understand the impact that these things are having. And it's not just about CO2, which is the one that we talk about all the time as one of the emissions. There's other greenhouse emissions as well. So methane is responsible for 30% of our current warming. Um, but the good news is there's lots of practical solutions there that we can also use to mitigate methane. So again, it's mainly about optimization, plugging leaks in oil and gas industries. It's looking at waste prevention, another topic uh, that we you could have a whole talk on, and is looking at like how we don't overproduce in the first place, right? Because that's a lot of the things that lead to waste. So we've discussed how technology can help us locate and optimize systems, and I hope these projects have also inspired you a little bit. Um, but how can we also apply this to user-facing products? So not everyone is working on these kind of data science products. Not everyone is um, kind of involved in that area of industry. Some of us are building products where people do buy stuff, people do make online decisions. And um, I do want to preface this by saying I do not believe that the climate crisis will be solved by individuals alone. Um, I think we need to have significant change in industry and regulation to be able to make this sustainable. But I do think that we as individuals have a right to understand the impact of our choices. And I think we should be able to do those things when we're in physical stores, but also when we're online and when we're thinking about travel, voting, choosing energy suppliers, and any of these different kind of uh, tasks. So, Ecosia, the search engine for a better planet, has this mission. That's one of the reasons why I work there, and also one of the reasons why I really want to highlight their work. So, let's check who's still with me. Who knows Ecosia? Amazing, talk done. Um, <laughs> well, that's the biggest amount of hands raised that I have seen any time that I've given these kind of talks. So that's awesome. I still, provide, still prepared slides, of course, just in case folks aren't familiar or maybe less familiar with our mission. So we believe that saving our world shouldn't cost you the earth. We're integrating a positive impact into your everyday actions. The stuff that you're doing anyway, like browsing the internet, searching uh, you know, for coding solutions, shopping online, and so much more. And we think that being neutral is no longer good enough, so we really want to share this power to be climate active. We're doing that uh, through putting 100% of the profits of the company into initiatives for the planet. We have China, uh, transparent financial reports that we publish every month, um, so you can see exactly what we're doing with that money. We're planting and protecting trees, working with local communities because they are the folks that have the knowledge and focusing on native species that offer long-term survival for themselves as trees, uh, but also for the community around them because this is we need everyone on board to make this work. We're not just producing enough renewable energy to power all of your searches, but twice that. Uh, 
and we also choose to run our cloud services in fully renewable energy zones. And we're trying to call out greenwashing so you can identify for yourselves where the biggest polluters are. So here you can see a little bit how that looks, if I'm not stood in the front of it. Uh, we have these like kind of little labels embedded somewhat unintrusively in your search experience to offer you guidance and insights to what others are doing uh, towards the climate crisis. So this one, for example, is the climate impact tracker, which looks at countries' commitments. Uh, we have one that's not pictured here that looks at companies' climate pledges, so you can understand better what companies are doing towards this. And what you might be wondering is, that looks great. Thank you. Uh, but where's all the data for this? So I want to give a specific example so I can kind of focus down onto what the point that I would like to make. So we recently added a shopping vertical um, that would actually also prioritize sustainable options at the top row. The lower rows would uh, not be prioritized in exactly this way, but they would be labeled if we had available data for them. But focusing on this top row, this is kind of what the data looks like. So we have all of the regular product data that you would expect uh, to see for products, but we also are looking at uh, different aspects of sustainability, which we then aggregate into a single score so we can choose how to rank them. Now, it's these different aspects which make this challenging. So having a single label might, be, might feel sufficient. Oh, thank you. Um, but it can easily lead us into this false sense of comfort that our choice has made the impact that we desire without us fully understanding the scope of what that impact was. So we really need to take a holistic view and look at the entire life cycle of products from manufacturing to the end of use. So that's what we're trying to do with these different aspects of the sustainability. And that's why it's really important to have domain experts in the mix. So this, pro uh, this project was part of the Green Consumption Assistant and it's a partnership with the Berliner Hochschule für Technik and the Technical University of Berlin, plus Ecosia, uh, and plus specifically the team that I'm part of. And we were really looking how we can best communicate these nuances to our users in a way that they can make more informed decisions, but it's also like easy to kind of absorb and take in during your search experience and not something that you then have to take a bunch of time to start researching. So again, this isn't about shaming or forcing users or saying like, you as an individual have to make these choices. This is about giving inf information and allowing people to make their own choices based on that. So far, so good, but what are the challenges? So, as I mentioned, we're not just looking at a single label. And if you're on other shopping platforms, you might have noticed, actually nowadays, we see a lot of these single labels on goods. But it's also understanding what the labels mean. Um, and it's also trying to extract the sustainability information out of them. So, big problem with data like this is, first of all, very few items even have this information to begin with. Uh, next, labels aren't particularly standardized, so some labels sound very good, but actually, when you look further into them, are not quite achieving maybe what they claim, or the impact is unfortunately less than would be desirable. Clothing specifically, because clothing, of course, is something that we, we tend to go through a lot, you know, like fast fashion is a thing, uh, and even if you're not buying into that, the seasons and all sorts of reasons why you might need to buy new clothes. But like category taxonomies for clothing products are vastly different. So we ended up having to like map these for different providers, which was not a particularly easy task, certainly time consuming. 
And also, overall, this data just needs a lot of cleaning. That's probably one that you could fairly put up there for most data, but yeah, I'll add it. <laughs> what I'd like to call for is that we build sustainability into our standards. So having this already in our product schemas, alongside other attributes such as size, color, brand, would already really shift it into a place where it's easy to uh, showcase what is behind these products. So like, what does it take to manufacture this product? What's its life cycle? What happens when you stop using it? Is it something that is biodegradable or is it something that's going to sit in the landfill? Um, and I'm going a little bit quicker because I'm not quite sure about the time, but the green database eventually is our solution right now for tackling this. It's open source, so you can go and have a look at the data set yourself. It's what's currently fueling, pun fully intended, uh, the Ecosia shopping vertical. Um, and you'll be able to see there how we're going around scraping providers and putting this data together. Um, there is a small caveat that the data set here is actually larger than what we... We do some processing in Ecosia ourselves before we add it into our vertical, so this is a slightly wider data set, but that's just a small asterisk side note. And it leads me to another point, which is I'd really like to encourage us all to do this in the open. So Florian says open science is a key to innovation, collaboration and discovery and that by sharing data methods and results and making them accessible and comparable, we can accelerate excuse me, the process of science and ultimately benefit society. And I really believe that's also true for technology. So as much as possible, I really feel like we should be doing open source. It's a great platform for us to be able to get different voices, different perspectives into these topics, um, because that's what we really need to achieve our goal on this climate crisis. Again, I don't believe uh, that it will be some moonshot kind of tech that's going to solve this for us. So that's where I'm coming from. If you're interested to find out more, uh, I really highly recommend checking out two projects. First one being Climate Change AI. Um, I did their summer school uh, this year and it was excellent. All of that material is available online for free in like YouTube videos and Jupyter notebooks. So there's also ways that you can run the code and explore it yourself. Uh, Climate Action Tech, I'd also really like to give them a shout out because uh, that's a great platform. I already made some friends here through it, so <laughs> that's exciting. Uh, but there's like groups here in Hamburg, people also in Berlin, I'm, I'm based in Berlin, uh, and there's different topics ranging from green infrastructure to a, a book club. They're currently reading the book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. I'm quite behind the club, but it, so far, really good reading. And I'm not sure if I had, do I have like five minutes left? Can I go over a little bit? I'll look at Doreen. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> I have this one other section that I wanted to also just add in here because not everyone might be working on like these data science projects or in infrastructure. Um, and I think it's really important to highlight that we can all kind of have an impact here. Um, and as a software engineer myself, I'm always looking for ways that my code can make an impact. So there's really a lot of ways that we uh, can approach this. I think we've, okay, perfect. I think we, I'm gonna be over two minutes, but <laughs> forgive me. Uh, <laughs> I think we, um, we have come from an era where we kind of felt like we had unlimited resources at least that's kind of what it, approach, it, it felt like to me when I got into tech, where it's like, oh, you can run this on the cloud and you can run this over here. And hey, why not spin up a Docker container over there? Um, and I think we're actually coming to a point where we need to like actually like revert a little bit on that. Um, because e-waste and uh, kind of like hardware are one of the big uh, emission um, polluters out there and I think we we really have a responsibility to be a little bit more proactive on this so like reducing the size and footprint of your code base 
for example, a static site over a CMS. Uh, infrastructure inefficiencies, so like, you know, this can really impact if you uh, have a data center and your infrastructure is inefficient. Um, using SVGs instead of images. Leverage CDNs so you can reduce the distance that your data is traveling. Um, don't auto-load uh, videos or even images if they're not super necessary. Give people the option maybe with an alt text alt text to see if they want to load it. Uh, reduce your CI runs, uh, reduce network traffic as much as possible anyway, and sunset services that are no longer needed. I love sunsetting a service, you know, when you're like, ah, we're not really using it, it's just kind of sat there. Maybe we can just move the code over here and like get rid of the whole service. It's like one less responsibility, a bunch of line of codes gone, less mental context, and also, you know, better for the planet. So. Love Sunsana service. Um, Scaleway have a great blog on this. And I also really recommend to check out Anna's Miro board. It is amazing. She's sat here in the audience. Wow, what a great collection of resources. So I really want to highlight, highlight that. Uh, and as I mentioned, electronic waste, I'm, you know, I'm going to skip this slide because I feel like I somewhat covered it. I wanted to jump to this one because Anna also spoke yesterday about the uh, corporate sustainability reporting, also known as the CSRD in Germany. And this is all nice. It's nice to do these things, but also you will have to do these things sooner or later because regulations are going to come in that are going to tell us that we need to be doing them. So the corporate sustainability reporting is one. France also has some rather strict guidelines that are for eco-designed websites, and that's likely to move into EU law as well, focusing on raising awareness of carbon impact of digital services. And there's always dual benefits as well. So like often sites that are optimized in this way also perform better when you're doing search engine optimization. Less energy consumption also means less cost. And also, there's a lot of potential for better accessibility of your website as well. So, I mean, it's win-win. Okay, so I hope you've taken away that there's many things that you can do, uh, and we cannot do it alone. So I hope everyone in this room, I feel like you're already converts, uh, but hopefully you can go away and multiply this message. Consider your own carbon footprint, especially the hardware uh, and your own digital e-waste. Think of the tools you're using, and this is my shameless plug. You'll already use Ecosia, maybe share it with your friends too. And if you are an Ecosia user and sometimes you don't get the results you want, my top tip is to use the hashtag G at the start or at the end of your search. And then for that search, you will go to our good friend Google. And you can still keep using Ecosia as your main search engine, but you don't have to compromise. Advocate for sustainable software practices where you work and join local climate action initiatives. So today, folks might know that the Fridays for Futures are out striking. I came here to talk with you all. Um, and so the rest of my colleagues are actually at the strike. But I really highly recommend to kind of join those initiatives uh, if you can and also encourage your employer to help you to do so. Uh, we have a policy in the company that you can use work time for this. And follow open source projects and contribute if you can. So last but not least, and then I'm done, uh, let's keep the conversation going. As I mentioned earlier, this is just some of my ideas on this topic. I'd really love to hear yours. So if you want to reach out to me, feel free. Thank you very much. <laughs> And sorry for going over. <laughs>